All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbeen.com. Welcome to one more show. So I hope you had a great weekend. Today, the basic uh, discussion that I want to do is about the worst or vaccine adverse event reporting system by CDC. So this is what you have to decide how much you trust or you do not trust or how much the data is accurate or not accurate. But I'm going to work with that data. There are two ways that we are going to work with that data today. One is to look at the CDC site itself, the worst site, and do some searching of our own. Plus, I also want to take some data that they had already data smithed or put it together to present internally. Once again, let's say that we do not trust that data or their take on it. It still is interesting to look at what are they looking at and what are they thinking about? For me, the curiosities were, uh, how about the number of deaths? Then how about the uh, um, tinnitus? How about pregnancies or miscarriages? And then what about various vaccines and their ratio of various problems? So that is what I wanted to look at. And so based on that, I have certain uh, thoughts that I've, I've made as well to say which kind of vaccine should be OK for which kind of a group of people. So I'm going to discuss that at the end of the adverse reactions as well, just to provide my take on it. So let's start a discussion. So we'll start with my <laughs> little, uh, this is my one of the paintings I did over this weekend. I haven't yet named it. It seems like something to do with afternoon. So I'll at some point name it. So this is the art for you for today. These are the links that I have used. So this is drbean.com. I'm going to close it. Then these are the, uh, this would be Bloomberg talking about the number of doses that are given. So in the US now, 317 or almost 318 million doses administered, 49 sorry, 53% to one, uh, one dose, and then 45% two doses. This is CDC's data, also depicting the same thing. What is interesting for me is that last time when we discussed the worst events or the events present in the worst system, I was struggling with trying to figure out where is the data for how many Pfizer vaccines administered, Moderna vaccines administered. So here is a link, and these links are present in the description as well if you wanted to go and look them up. So this was interesting for me to keep in keep near when we are discussing. Then there is this uh, uh, presentation that is their own internal meeting presentation on April 23rd of this year, where they talked about the clotting, the issues with the clotting, the chances of clotting, and so on. So I have that open in another uh, app. So I'm going to close it here. Link is in the description. This is another presentation that they have prepared. So Tom Shima Bokuru, I, I appreciate him because he has done a lot of data collection and putting it together. So maybe at some point we should invite him to come talk here. Uh, this is about the vaccine safety updates with general adverse reactions. In here, again, the link is in the description. They have talked about deaths. They have talked about other uh, adverse reactions, for example, pain and uh, myalgias and fatigue. But they have more importantly talked about um, pregnant women and possibility of miscarriages or miscarriages counted and the pregnancies that occurred, and so on. So that is an important thing to look at. This is the verse itself, or vaccine adverse events reaction uh, reporting system. So I'll be looking at this one with you. We have looked at it once more, but we look at that here today as well. Then this is the, and I do not know how good or bad they are, factcheck.org. But there is a, an interesting set of links here. So I used this article to see that there are some links that may be useful for when you are doing your research. Then this is the AAP. And here, the cases of myocarditis. So that is another uh, adverse events uh, collection that I wanted to look at to see that messenger RNA-based vaccines, what is their ratio and what is their behavior? 
with the with the heart then this is the myocarditis and cdc's um, take on it and then how do we see where is myocarditis what are the labs to do for myocarditis and how to manage it in the management they simply say that he has sent the patient to a cardiologist so don't think that they have a lot of medicines here and then uh, this is another thing which actually made me very upset i think it made many people very upset and that is that the cardiac issues are seen more in the younger people from the age 12 to 16 to 18 they're much more in there and i'll show you as i scroll through the data that the the imbalance or the or the density of these issues or the number of events that are occurring in the younger group is a lot they say it is a lot they themselves recognize that to be a lot and then on june 18th they actually had the meeting um, scheduled then the juneteenth was declared as a federal holiday and they decided not to continue with their meeting and this is what they said the june 18 2021 covid 19 meeting is being rescheduled due to the observation of the juneteenth national independence day holiday the discussion will be rescheduled to be included as part of June 23 to 25 ACIP meeting. This is how indifferent this group is. So anyways, I wanted to, uh, this just makes me very angry. So here we are. So with these, now let's start our discussion. This is the this is the vaccine safety update. Look at the date here. This is March 1. So March, April, May, June. It is a few months behind. Then look at this one. The date here. This is for the clotting. The date is the April. So sorry. So this is April 23rd. Then this is uh, Johnson and Johnson's FDA briefing, and I'm going to use some data from here to discuss with you. So these are all the things that we have. Now let's look at first the data, and then we will look at the we'll do the actual searching there as well. And this, I want to also say this uh, little statement before. It is not necessary that all events are reported here. It is also not necessary that all worst event are reported here. My wife has had many events and didn't report them. Similarly, it's not necessary that all events here are vaccine associated. It is also not necessary that many vaccine associated events are here. So I do not know if there is a an independent body that actually has the right count of the adverse reactions. Please just give me one second. I think Luffy is in the other room and is scratching the door. One second, please. Apologies. So <clears throat> let's start our discussion now. So some administrative things here in the coming days. So we this Wednesday, day after tomorrow, we'll have Dr. Shankara Shetty with us. Uh, then we'll have Dr. Bream in the evening. Dr. Shankara would be with us in the morning, 9 a.m. So this Wednesday, so day, day after tomorrow, 9 a.m., we'll have Dr. Shetty with us. In the evening, we'll have Dr. Bream with us. Uh, Dr. Shetty, I think you have heard about him. He has treated many patients, and he claims that he did not have any single patient dying. We'll, we'll ask him what is his protocol and how does he manage. Dr. Bream is a emergency physician here in the US. So we'll ask him that how does he manage patients of COVID. Then on Thursday, we'll have Dr. Bruce Patterson. Dr. Bruce Patterson has done something remarkable and his team, of course, and that is that for long haul post COVID and long haul post vaccine. Um, presence of the spike proteins inside the monocytes is a very interesting discovery. I think that he should be recognized and appreciated for that. So we'll have him with us on this Thursday to discuss what he has found, he and his team. 
Then we are connecting with uh, Samina's help, Dr. Samina, who is here in the Cool Beans as well. We're connecting with Dr. Alam. And Dr. Alam is the doctor who started using ivermectin and I believe doxycycline after Dr. Kelly from Australia did the, the study on ivermectin. So in my opinion, Dr. Alam is the, the one who broke ground on actually using ivermectin for COVID and then reported back and said, hey, this looks good. And from there, the whole world started working on it. I, I remember I started talking about it and it just kept spreading. We'll also have Dr. Merrick. I'm hoping next week, but my uh, assistant is working with him to figure out what is a good time for him to join us. We'll have Dr. Corey come back as well. We have Steve Kirsch joining us on June 30. Some more things. I hope that Jenna is doing OK and she is happy and healthy. If anybody knows about her, please tell us as well. Uh, Margaret's phone, I called her before this talk as well. Her phone is still broken. I think she's planning to buy a new phone because the previous phone is taking time. And then uh, we still miss France. So France is taking a break. Uh, I hope she's doing OK and well and happy. Um, but we miss her. On uh, certain more things, there was an article that was published today that was tweeted by FSCCC in which one of my quotation was there. Um, then Friday, I am with the same journalist and going to have an audio podcast as well with him. And then there are a few more journalists that are talking with me. So just these are some announcements. Let's start. First of all, the number of deaths. This is the search that I did. My search and the numbers that are provided by the CDC's own team, although the months are different, but of course, these tiny number of months are not going to make a difference. They, their search is different. They, their reporting is different. For example, if I look at number of deaths here, they are saying, So check this out. This is, again, an earlier, I believe, March time frame, 456 reports of death following Moderna vaccine and 510 following Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. This is one. Second, their own discussion or the statements about this to media. So I read some articles as well, uh, especially one article in Routers, just so that if somebody asks that, hey, where did you read it? Routers. And they said that, they contacted CDC and CDC said that we did investigation of the deaths and we don't think that any of those deaths are because of the vaccine. These are other causes of deaths. So I don't believe that fully. And maybe I mistook it. Maybe I misread it. But I don't believe that there can be 100% uh, no deaths from the vaccine. Uh, I'll give you one example that Florida's doctor, poor uh, doctor who was healthy, my age, maybe slightly older, and who had the vaccine and then he developed idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura and died within two to three weeks. I surely feel that that was because of the Moderna vaccine. So just saying that, hey, these are not because of it is, anyways, I don't want to be a ranting match here. I want to go over the data to see what they have provided. So their data is actually kind of, investigated data, looked at data, and then they came come back and they say, okay, we think these are the ones that may be near and associated. When I did the worst, and I'll show you the worst data right now. So for example, Pfizer-BioNTech, 2,124. There is also one more difference, and that is that this is, if you see Moderna, number of uh, people vaccinated is 56 million. And here the number is, for example, 131 million. So it is possible that these are correct numbers. It's just that the number of months are different. So Pfizer-BioNTech, 2,124. Moderna, 2,316. Johnson & Johnson, 319. And these are the number of doses given. This is today's data. And I would quickly show you how that data I saw. Um, last time when I was looking at this data, I made an error and I just added everybody in there, all symptoms in there. So hopefully, first I have to refresh this page so that they can ask me about my disclaimer. This disclaimer is going to say that, hey, 
this uh, number of ev events that we would see here does not necessarily mean that it was the vaccine's fault or the healthcare workers' fault. So we agree with that and we continue. Now here in the request form, I'm gonna, instead of symptoms, I'm going to say vaccine manufacturer. So that would now come, the data would be showing up as Moderna, Pfizer, Janssen and Janssen. Then down, you could turn on the verse ID and what will happen is that for each data piece, you would have the description of that as well. So I am more interested in the counts at the moment. So I'm gonna go down here and then say, for example, it just keeps becoming. So we're not interested in all vaccines. We are interested in COVID at this time. So I'm gonna click on COVID. And over here, I don't have to choose in individual manufacturers because choosing COVID would already filter to their manufacturers, to the COVID vaccine manufacturers. Then here, I'm gonna uh, click on death. And then down here, you can give the dates if you want. For example, the reporting date within 2020 or 2021. I'm just gonna leave that part because these vaccines are within 2020 and 2021. So if, even if I didn't give those dates, it should work. So here is the data. So if you see here, uh, Johnson & Johnson on the top, Janssen. Janssen is Johnson & Johnson. Last time when I did this, some folks asked me afterwards that, hey, what was Janssen? So that is Johnson & Johnson, 417. Moderna, 2,398. Pfizer, 2,238. Uh, 2, Unknown, 25. Total, 5,078. And here is the, the percentages amongst them. And not ratio to each other, but the percentage of uh, the number of deaths. That also is uh, dependent upon the number of doses given. So with this, and they count up to 108% for some reason. So back here, this is the number of deaths. Now, of course, from the news that we hear and from the word of mouth that is traveling, the number of deaths that are supposed to be out there are more. This is what is in the verse data. Then I wanted to look at pregnancy. Are people becoming pregnant? Are women becoming pregnant after receiving the vaccine? Number one and number two, are there miscarriages after the vaccine? So I actually did some search. I had been actually sitting <laughs> today trying to do those searches and figuring it out. And the problem is that within verse, that data is all over the place because if somebody, for example, somebody would say, uh, I am pregnant and I took the vaccine and I am now dizzy. And that would show up as pregnant. So that does not mean that the person became pregnant. That means the person was pregnant and received the vaccine. So I didn't have a good way of filtering out to say those who were not pregnant and then became pregnant. So I am going to use the data that they have already worked on. Again, you like it, you don't like it, but that data is important and it is here. So if I go down here, this is actually a good document to just glance at, but I wanna look at the pregnancy. So COVID-19 vaccine safety in pregnancy. So this is their data. And that is that again, Feb 16, this is not even March, Feb 16, Pfizer, BioNTech, 28 million people received one dose. Then 1.7 million people put their safety event in the system. From those events, they calculated that 16,039 people became pregnant in Pfizer-BioNTech. In Moderna, 26 million people were uh, administered the dose by Feb 16, one or more. 2 million people, 2.12 million people had added their, their event to the safety system. 
14,455 people became, women became um, pregnant. So total out of 55.2 million people who were given the vaccine, 30,494 became pregnant. So first question in the mind that, hey, can women still become pregnant? Yes. Is there any issue with the fertility? Now the question is pregnancy in non-vaccinated or as we say, the, the background data. Background data is that what is a normal pregnancy rate, for example, in the US. Now compare that for the same duration with the vaccinated folks pregnancy rate and see if that rate has been different. So yes, there are people becoming pregnant. Are they less or are they more? So that is the data which there is some part of that data that is uh, available next. So let's see here. So the reactions that were seen in pregnant women, most common was pain, then swelling, redness, itching. That was Pfizer-BioNTech. Moderna, most common was pain, again, at the injection site, swelling, redness, and itching. And similarly, you can just quickly glance at the other one. This is post-vaccination -vac local reaction. So if you see fatigue, headache, myalgia, chills, nausea, fever. So these are general, just like others. The question is, are there any miscarriages? So we safe participants. So once again, this data is not a study. This is not somebody following people to say, did you become pregnant? Were you already pregnant? Did you have a miscarriage and so on? This is data that is voluntarily presented. So we safe participants who report pregnancy following COVID-19 vaccinations are actively contacted to enroll in pregnancy registry. Participants are contacted once per trimester after delivery and when the infant is three months old. So once they say that, hey, I'm pregnant, then they actively ask them that, hey, please keep us updated. Outcome of the interest include miscarriage, stillbirth, pregnancy complications, maternal intensive care unit admission, adverse birth outcome, neonatal death, infant hospitalization, and birth defects. So maternal issues and child issues. So here they, they have the number. Again, Feb 19, registry participants to date, almost 2,000. This is uh, whoever <laughs> put this slide together, they have no sense of colors. So putting orange or red on blue creates a shimmering effect, and you cannot read it correctly, but they have it. This is te technologists. So here, pregnancy outcome, miscarriages, less than 20 weeks. Background rate is the rate that they're comparing to the population that generally have miscarriage. So they are saying that 26% of the uh, people in this, in of this size of the population that is vaccinated. So let's say 25 million pop, uh, vaccinated. Then you take another 25 million women who are not vaccinated or of similar size. And then you see for the same duration and see how many miscarriages were there. So 26% in the vaccinated individuals, 15%. Still, and I kept thinking that did vaccine help? Of course, vaccine is not helping. In my opinion, um, people who are less nervous or maybe healthier were getting a vaccine. So somebody who is already pregnant may not actually move ahead or somebody who is not healthy yet, they may not, they do, may not want to have one more complication. So there may be some reasons like that. This is just my conjecture. So 15% and they have this uh, uh, footnote down here that says that 93% of these were pregnancy losses less than 13 weeks of age. Then stillbirth after 20 weeks. Usual background rate is 0.6%. And vaccinated people's stillbirth rate was 1%. So 0.4% more. Pregnancy complications. Gestational diabetes, that is a woman becoming diabetic during the pregnancy, 7 to 14%, 10%, then preeclampsia, hypertension, uh, prehypertension, 10 to 15%, 15%. I'm using loose terms, so please uh, 
go with me. Eclampsia, actually the hypertensive crisis occurring, 0.27% and 0%. Uh, intrauterine growth restriction, so that is a baby's situation, 3 to 7% and 1%. Neonatal side, so that is maternal and pregnancy complications. Now on the child side, preterm birth, 10%, 10%. Congenital anomalies, 3%, 4%, 1% more. Small for gestational age, 3 to 7%, 4%. So here there is a range over there they had 4%. Neonatal death, 0.38% background and 0% uh, in vaccinated. And here are their sources. So miscarriages, stillbirths, diabetes and other they have put their sources out there as well once again sources are good or sources are bad this is the data and these are the sources characteristics of covid 19 19 vaccine pregnancy reports to worse so characteristics for example age and trimesters and vaccine which vaccine had more cases versus the other so if you see here pfizer biontech 97, 63, Moderna, 56, 36, and unreported 1 and 0 0.6. Adverse events in pregnant women following COVID-19 vaccine reported to worse through Feb 16. So this is women was pregnant before, got the vaccine, then reported the adverse event. So here, Pregnancy neonatal specific conditions. So spontaneous abortion or miscarriage, 29. And that is a percentage, I believe. Premature rupture of membrane, 3%, fetal hydro, 2%, and so on. Are these percentages? They are not percentages. These are counts. Up top is the percentage only. So these are the counts. Then down here, non-pregnancy specific adverse events. So these are pain at the site of injection or myalgias or fatigue. So 112. So safety activities, and they have a bunch of other data here. And the summary here. <clears throat> so check this out. Most reports to worse among pregnant women involved non-pregnancy specific adverse reactions, which is fine. Uh, almost everyone would say, I have pain at the site of injection or I'm, I'm fatigued. Or, Miscarriage was the most frequently reported pregnancy specific adverse event to worse. Numbers are within the known background rates based on presumed COVID-19 vaccine doses administered to a pregnant woman. So this was on the pregnancy side. I'm now going to go back to my uh, description. And uh, we'll do a discussion after this or maybe in chit chat, but I want to go over the data to look at it. Then is the blood clotting. So, of course, blood clotting has been a big issue. And I want to continue to stress this. I did not believe that the clotting was because of the spike proteins when the very first Florida doctor's death occurred or when the clotting was reported from um, UK and uh, Europe and when the very first research paper that came out as well that also proved that clotting was not the spike protein. It is very difficult for spike proteins to get out and just go to a specific organ. If they're going to distribute, they're going to distribute everywhere. It is the immune system. It is the trigger by the vaccine, the immune system, and the response of the immune system that causes the damage. So I still stand by my statement. This is the data up to April 2012th. Pfizer-BioNTech, and let me show you the data. Here is that data. So thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, and that is what they have here. This data that I'm presenting is from here. Uh, they have done a good job of actually talking about it, showing wh where the thrombosis occurs in the brain, and then various reports. So here are the reports that I'm going to go through. Pfizer-BioNTech, out of 97 million cases, zero was reported till April 12th. Moderna, 84.7 million, three cases. 
Johnson and Johnson, 6.8 million, six cases. Johnson and Johnson is adenovirus based. And we now know clearly that adenovirus based vaccines tend to cause more clotting, and especially in women uh, under 50 years of age. Out of these, three died. So this is women lesser than 50 years of age. So if I go back here, this is Janssen, Pfizer, Moderna. And then they have that summary over here. This was their health alert about this. We all know that what did they do? They simply said, we'll continue. And this is why that Juneteenth, their rescheduling of the briefing, as much as I became angry, I also th thought that what, what were they going to do? They were going to say, yes, we are aware of it. Yes, it happens. We should give an extra warning and we'll continue moving forward because the benefit is greater than the risk. And I thought that to give that kind of a statement, again, I am making an opinion and a conjecture. I may be wrong. But to give that kind of a statement, they can give that statement whenever they want. So maybe they also know that. I'm, I'm angry at them. So I become a little sarcastic in these things. So now, other things that I wanted to see, tinnitus. So I looked at the ringing in the ears or uh, tinnitus itself. And so if I go back here to, to verse events, and I say, once again, vaccine manufacturer is this one. I'm not going for verse ID. If you choose verse ID, you can see every single case and read what is happening there. Here, um, I'm going to take COVID. It is a slightly interesting or messy. So I'm going to say all events because the tinnitus of that is not here. But down at the bottom, I can actually write a description. So here in the description, I'm going to say tinnitus or ringing. I can put ear as well. But if you just put ear, there would be many cases of ear, for example, inflammation or pain in the ear. So I removed ear, and I just had tinnitus and ringing. So this is not going to be very accurate, but still give us an idea. And here, if you see Johnson & Johnson, 61. Moderna, 331. Pfizer, BioNTech, 422. How accurate is that? I do not know. I think more people have it than what is showing up here. I I know more, a lot of people that have it. So back here, tinnitus, Bell's palsy. Similarly, you can look it up. I want to talk about myocarditis as well. So myocarditis or the inflammation of the heart. I've done this discussion before that myocarditis or the inflammation of the heart muscle or pericarditis, which is the inflammation of the outer covering of the heart. These are mostly going to be, in my opinion, and we'll see if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Uh, I think that is antibodies against the vaccine that when they are generated, they go and attack the heart or the pericardium in some patients. And I'm going to use a mixture of data because there is not a very decent area, one area where all this data is present. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to go here. They have done um, a good collection of data. So here, although they say that 226 cases of myocarditis for people under 30, actually, there were more cases. So if you see here, there are a total of 789 cases, if you see here. But they kind of showed a smaller number to say under 30, they were lesser. So when you're reading this, don't be deceived that the number was less. Number is actually more, but they bracketed that number here by saying in people 30 and under. And that is how they went away with uh, just showing a smaller number. They do put the bigger, bigger number down here. So federal health officials have verified 226 cases of myocarditis or pericarditis in people aged 30 and younger who have received a an mRNA vaccine. 
And this is what is really concerning. While rare, so they have to put the word rare so people don't object too much. They are rare. The rates for age 16 to 24, youngsters, following the second dose are above what is expected, are above what is expected. And I'll show you some of that. Prompting an emergency meeting of the Center for Disease Control, which now we know that emergency meeting was not really that much emergent for them. They changed it. And uh, I'm going to show you this data here as well from Dr. Shima Bukhuru. 789 cases, zeroing in on. So they have then given bro breakdown. I want to go back here for a second and just look at the summary first. 789 cases, median age 24. Median age 24. Mostly men and, of course, younger men, boys. 226 in youth, lesser than 30 years of age. 16 to 24 more cases. And here is what is really concerning, and that is this. Between the age of 12 to 24, 12 to 24, 53% of the cases are occurring in this group, while this group only makes up 9% of the cases of vaccinations. This group, number one, look, this is a young group. And I think folks who have been listening to me for some time, they know that I'm very sensitive about children. So 12 to 24 is a very young age. They are only 9% so far. They, they have now approved the vaccination for the children. So the, this number is going to increase. Only 9% of all the vaccinated are this group. But 53% of all the clotting is occurring in this group. And they still went to say, we will do it in the next meeting. They didn't even bother to send out a statement to say, you know what, for a week, do not administer this vaccine anymore. But I know why they didn't do it. Again, I'm, I'm putting an opinion out. So this is Mubin upset. So that's why I'm, I try not to give such opinions because I could be wrong. Um, they must have thought that if we said stop, that would cause people to become anxious, hesitancy would increase, numbers would reduce, and we would have a problem at our hand. We'll have to go back and convince again. So because of that, let's just not say it. But that also means that during this time, when they are observing the holiday and went away, there could be more children getting this vaccine and then getting pericarditis. So that is what uh, made me unhappy, angry. Um, so maybe I'll be doing a thing today that I have not done so far in my talks. And that is to say which group should not take which vaccine. So if you see here, um, the so back here to the inflammation. So if you see down here, he noted, so this is the doctor, he noted reports of myocarditis, pericarditis in young people aged 12 to 24 make up about 53% of the total reports of a second dose. However, these age groups only make up about 9% of the doses. Clearly, we have an imbalance here. Clearly, they know it. And clearly, they're still rescheduled. They observed the Juneteenth. So uh, anyways, then they continue on and they do this discussion. Um, I want to now discuss based on some of this data. This is not an exhaustive discussion. I want to talk more about other cases, for example, Bell's palsy, autoimmune dis disorders and outcomes there. Uh, we'll see some more down here as well. But first, I want to talk about what vaccines make sense for what group and what vaccines should not be given to which groups of people. So here, women, more than 50 years of age, none of the vaccine has shown any adverse effects other than standard adverse effects. So any vaccine will work. Younger than 50, 50 years of age, 
women should not be given adenovirus based vaccine and if that is the only choice and the woman wants it then they should there should be a protocol to say before the vaccine start administering blood thinners after the vaccine start monitoring ask them to talk with their provider on daily basis talk about any headaches or shortness of breath or leg pain or git pains or persistent headaches and so on or bruising on the on the skin somebody left me a comment yesterday that my wife got a vaccine and now she has for two days blood under the skin here and there and we would go to the primary care tomorrow and i said you got to take her to emergency because if this is happening inside the brain she's in trouble so there should be a appropriate protocol observed and if not then this is a danger for women now under 30 years of age for women no messenger rna vaccine although the messenger rna vaccine based pericarditis is more common in men but if you look at israel's uh, situation there were women and men and the two people who died one was a woman so that means there is a risk here as well for women too lesser than men but a risk so that should be something to consider so that means women under the age of 30 they have a problem if they go for adenovirus based vaccine they have a possibility of clotting and if they go for messenger rna based vaccine they have a possibility of inflammation cardiac inflammation cardiac inflammation is rarer than the clotting both are rare but they both are possible so this group women under the age of 30 have a, a problem how would i manage this if i was the one let's say i have a, a patient of this age what would i do what i'll do is this if she says that hey i want to have a vaccine i want to be protected then based on what she gets messenger rna that means i should start working with her for possible cardiac inflammation and the management of it for example there are tests to be done there are the chest pain is a very important sign to keep in mind and if she is going to go for adenovirus then i would put her on blood thinners and make sure that she knows complete protocol for how to do it i would have wished that this protocol would come from cdc's fda's and these uh, big wig organizations but in the absence of them i don't think we'll be sitting around to say well they didn't say anything so let's not do anything we would have to do something so this is one area then if we go to men greater than 30 years of age men all other vaccines all vaccines have shown similar um risk and efficacy so any vaccine is fine men under the age of 30 that is where moderna and pfizer or messenger rna based vaccines have this possibility of uh, cardiac inflammation and even causing death that means what that means let's say if men under the age of 30 are concerned about adenovirus which i think that adenovirus is lesser of a problem for under 30 men compared to messenger but i still like messenger more so this is just my own liking i'm explaining but if you look at it just from an objective point of view adenovirus based vaccine has a better chance for men under the age of 30 because it does not cause clotting in them as much as it does with the women and then uh, messenger rna based vaccines have a chance for cardiac inflammation i do not really agree with this idea when so many doctors have been talking with them re- recently who said that well it is really rare it is really less in number i think i'll be okay if that was the only choice even then there is a choice of not taking a vaccine and looking at the disease itself and seeing what could it that do but let's say vaccine has to be taken but the person wants to take it then there is a choice adenovirus or messenger and if messenger is going to cause even with a rare possibility of inflammation then maybe adenovirus is a better choice now i want to go to this johnson and johnson for a second and talk about american indian alaska american indians or alaskans 
and people with the greater than 60 years of age with one or more comorbidities. So I'm going to present something that is FDA's own document of Johnson & Johnson. This is not this is not a rumor I have picked up from somewhere. This is, if you see here, Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting, Feb 26, FDA briefing document, Janssen. This is their own document. And I have my, um, I believe, my page number is 27 to go to, so give me a second. This is the same document that I used to do the very first um, talk about uh, Johnson & Johnson. So here, if you look at this page 27, look at this, <clears throat> sorry. If you look at the page 27, race American Indian or Alaskan, efficacy 31.7%. So for Johnson & Johnson, for this group of people, Efficacy is 31.7%. That efficacy does not even rise up to the FDA's own threshold of 60% and above. So if you see here, subgroup, male, female, age, race. So in, in race subgroup, American Indians or Alaska, Alaskans, 31.7%. So in my opinion, this group should not take Johnson & Johnson because it is of not much use. And it is in their document. Second part is here. This is another table of vaccine efficacy of first occurrence of moderate to severe critical COVID-19, including not centrally confirmed cases. And look at this here. Age group and comorbidity presence. Age group, for example, 18 to 59, no comorbidity. And here is the um, efficacy, 68%. Look at this age group, greater than 60 and comorbidity, yes. Here is greater than 60 years of age, any group, anyone, greater than 60 years of age. Comorbidity, no, meaning they don't have diabetes or hypertension or other things. Look at the efficacy here. 72.4%. But if it is greater than or equal to 60 and the comorbidity is present, then the efficacy drops down to 42.3%. Same as above. It was even smaller here. 31.7%. And that was 42%. They both do not rise up to the FDA's own threshold. I cannot imagine why FDA did not say, hey, for this group, this vaccine is not effective. Don't give it to them. So back here, you tell me, how much time would it have taken for FDA to make this kind of a graph much more polished, much more beautiful? I did it myself. They would have given it to some... Um, a beautiful artist who would do a beautiful work and they would pay him, let's say, $1,000, and this would come out polished. How much time would it or effort would it take? They don't do it for, I believe, operational problems. That if we say this, now people would then question it and it would become difficult to convince them. So look, American and Indian, American Indian and Alaskans, no JNJ. 60 years and older with one or more comorbidities, no JNJ. Their own document shows it. Then, JNJ, how when you're giving JNJ women, 60 years and above, if no comorbidities, then okay. 60 years and above with comorbidity, we just saw, cannot give JNJ. Women under 50 years of age cannot give JNJ. So what is really the sliver of the population in women that can receive JNJ? 50 to 60. Men, JNJ. 60 and above with a comorbidities, no JNJ. All the way down, JNJ, but American Indians and Alaskans, no JNJ. 
this should have they i don't think that cdc fda's or whoever are the responsible authorities i don't think they even had to publicize it to people they should have put that in front of the um, providers to say here is your algorithm go with this just like there are so many other algorithms that are provided to providers to say when you are doing this here is your algorithm they don't have this algorithm Then one more aspect, convalesced, convalesced patient or the patient who have recovered. I do not know how to pronounce it correctly. Somebody was upset with me <laughs> for the spike protein cytotoxicity. And they, they said, unsubscribed. And I don't have to suffer your accent anymore. So fine. So recovered patients, no need for a vaccine unless their immune system status has changed or the virus has mutated to be something else or they have spent so much time that the normal natural immunity may have declined. Otherwise, no need for uh, this uh, vaccination. I didn't get much data for the parts as well. The reason is that there are many, many uh, uh, symptoms of it and signs of it. And I had to collect them all and then count the numbers and put them together. And I just couldn't do that. Anaphylaxis, Pfizer, BioNTech, 4.7 cases per million. Moderna, 2.5 cases per million. The so Pfizer, BioNTech is a little higher than Moderna. So this is the vaccine related um, situation. I think more important than all the adverse events is this protocol to say who should get what. So I'm going to stop here. It's already one hour. And um, So I'm going to stop here. Please do me a favor. Please like, subscribe, and share. If you would like to support this work, there are three links in the description as well. You can buy me a coffee. You do not need to use a PayPal. Or you can use PayPal to support this work. Or you can be a patron. Thank you very much. And I would see you in five minutes for a chit chat.